And I'm tempted to go down to my office. So yeah, no class Wednesday, no test Wednesday. That will be Monday. I've got it. I've got it on the syllabus like that. So our last last exam is on Monday, and then um, whatever date on the syllabus the final is supposed to be on. I think it's like the seventh or something. But um, just take a look on the syllabus. So we're on, we're on immunity, which is the second part of the um, lymphatic chapter on the lymphatic system. I can see we're already behind. I'm supposed to get through um, digestive and respiratory. I can't see how that's going to happen, but I will get through one of them. <clears throat> All right, so immunity. Within immunity, there are two ways your body can deal with a pathogen depending on the threat. So we're going to break down immunity into general immunity and specific immunity. These are called different terms sometimes. Um, I think innate and adaptive, or whatever they are, it's the same idea. Is that <clears throat> there's things that infect you all the time that are really small. Um, you breathe in pollen, or you breathe in dust mites, or um, you get the you consume just bacteria that are not particularly virulent strains of bacteria or you know things like that you get pathogens in your body that are not like a big super big deal right and so we classify that under general immunity <clears throat> so general immunity are, are more specific things but they're smaller numbers so for example when you breathe in Pollen, pollen's not going to start dividing like crazy in your body, right? Coronavirus is specific immunity, and that is going to um, that's going to involve um, a larger reaction. And the parts of our immune system that fight general immunity and specific immunity are different. Right? The cells that you go, fuck. You know why I'm not saying anything to anyone? Because I've been late too. Until they recorded that. I might edit it out. So um, I probably won't edit anything. I'm just gonna post it. So general immunity, specific immunity, they're different as far as the, the threat. You know, something that's a, that involves a specific reaction is going to be, um, you're gonna have specialized cells and you're gonna make a lot of those cells. So you're gonna make like a clone army to go fight the specific disease. So our body's immune reaction to coronavirus isn't going to work for something else. So if we get infected with a bacteria, that immune system isn't going to work. It's specific for just that one virus. Even if we get the cold, the, the, like the flu, whatever the flu is, and we have coronavirus or vice versa, you've got to reactivate the immune system again. You have to do a whole separate immune system just for that. Whereas general immunity <clears throat> can take out lots of different things. If you happen to eat worm eggs, that happens to you all day. Then you eat some bacteria. Then 
you breathe in um, dust mites. There's small amounts and your body can just go after that. That part of your immune system can just take out everything. Whatever the threat is, you can take it out. But with general immunity, it's going to be a small number, right? They're not in your body and they're going to start um, replicating like crazy. Right? So they cannot handle large numbers of things. Your specific immune system does handle large numbers of things, but only one thing. So that's the difference. So within general immunity, we, we can break that into two types because you have two responses. There is a first line of defense and a second line of defense. The difference between the first line of defense and the second line of defense is if the pathogen broke past your epithelial tissue. So something just landing on the top of your skin, that's first line. Even something getting in your mouth, we consider that first line. So let's say you ate something and it just goes through your digestive system and then you excrete it out the other end. We consider that first line. We, even though it, like, it kind of goes in your body, we don't consider that in your body because it went into your esophagus, went into your stomach, it went through a tube, through your digestive system and out the other end. It didn't actually break through the epithelium and go into your interstitial fluid. So if something gets in your mouth, you spit it out. That's not in your body, you know, like a pathogen. Or if, or, or, or if you eat bad food and then you throw it up, that bacteria didn't get past the lining of your esophagus or the lining of your mouth. So that's still first line. Second line is once it gets into your body, once it gets past the epithelial tissue. <clears throat> so there's two different ways that your body handles that. Um, specific immunity is going to involve two different, also two different types of uh, responses. There is a response that's cellular in nature and a response that involves antibodies. So we call this cellular mediated or cell mediated And the other response is antibody mediated. <clears throat> so that kind of summarizes, well, that's like a, a really generalized notion of the immune system. Questions so far? So I'm going to address each of these, right? I'll go to general immunity first, and then I'll go to specific immunity. Broke my bracelet. I'll start with first line, second line, and then I'll go into specific. So let me just start with general. So general immunity, first line of defense, very simple stuff. So I'm going to give you some examples. We already talked about one example, kind of. Your skin is a very excellent defense. It's composed of, as you know, many layers of epithelial cells. If you just look at the epidermis, it has five or six, depending on where it is, whatever it was, about five different strata, corneum, all that stuff, right? And just take the strata corneum, that has like, I don't know, 100 layers of, of cells, right? So there's the, um, you know the skin is a great is is, is great protection. Um, I've got many diseases on my hands. 
Um, and I've, I've been like, okay, I had, and, 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 and then think about other less traumatic types of microbes. Um, you know, if bacteria or something lands on your skin, it's going to stay there, but your skin's always um, sloughing off, right? The, the lower layer of your epidermis is constantly producing new cells, and those cells are going up towards the um, strata corneum, and it's, it's, then it's falling off, right? So your skin is, you're constantly shedding skin. Um, so besides skin, you have um, saliva. Your saliva has some antimicrobial agents in it. It has something called a lysozyme. Um, so your saliva, and it keeps moving things around. Your saliva keeps moving things around. One of the things about um, microbes is you don't want to get them to colonize, like bacteria. You don't want bacteria to hang out, colonize, and start reproducing. So you want to just keep it moving. Um, I'm not really kind of going in any order here, but um, <clears throat> your tears, same idea. Lysozyme keeps things moving, doesn't allow the bacteria to get into your eye. You kind of flush it out with, with tears. Um, so you have your lacrimal apparatus. Um, you have, you can throw up. Or you can have diarrhea. That would be a way, that's a way of getting rid of something. When you have food poisoning, that's your body's response. What is this? Oh, we don't know what it is. Get rid of it now. Send it out. I don't know if I spelled emesis right. But throwing up. Right. Um, what else? Oh, SIBO. The your 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 the oil that your that your skin produces is inhospitable to um, a lot of pathogenic microbes. So things that infect your body, they have a certain temperature that they like, and they have a certain pH that they like. They like and, and that it's they like the temperature that's your body. They like the pH that's your body. They tend to do okay with stuff that is like seven or even eight. Maybe some of them can start to do nine, but they cannot do, they're not really good at handling like six or five. So um, your urine tract, your urinary tract, for example, for the most part, I mean, I know there are like UTIs, but for the most part, it's kept at a, at a pH that's inhospitable to um, most pathogens. And hair. Hair prevents, I'm not so much talking about this hair, but hair like nose hair, hair, uh, cilia. So, you know, the hair keeps, traps pathogens and keeps it from, um, from getting further into your body. Cilia are like are like kind of hairs. Um, they line your trachea. So last semester, if you learned about pseudostratified, ciliated, columnar, whatever, epithelial tissue, the point of it was, <clears throat> which I just did, you clear your throat many times in the day, right? And that's because of the cilia in your trachea. They kind of push the those finger-like projections, they push um, dust and things like that up far enough so that you can cough it out. So that also helps to push pathogens up if you happen to breathe them in. And hopefully the, the mucous membrane, let me add that. The mucous membranes hopefully trap it, right? A mucous membrane just think of the lining. The lining of anything in your body that's kind of moist, which is everything. 
lining of your nose, lining of your mouth, lining of your uh, trachea, esophagus, whatever. It's got it's got like a mucous membrane, right? It's not completely dry. That mucus also traps microbes and keeps them from getting around. All right. Um, you know, there's other stuff, but I think I've covered a lot of the first line of defense. Um, the the other video that I made might have some um, other examples. I mean, there's there's more than this, but these are all just natural defenses that that we have. And some of them are really good. One more, because I keep thinking of stuff. Your, the, the pH of your stomach is like uh, 2, 1.82. It's like super acidic. You know, if you remember pH, the scale goes from 0 to 14, 7 is neutral. 6 is 10 times more acidic than 7. 5 is 100 times more acidic than 7. So it's every time you move down a number, it becomes more acidic, and it's like times 10, times 10. Gastric juice is 2. So, I don't know. I add to that. That's math, so not dealing with that. 10,000 times more acidic? I don't know. A lot more acidic, right? So when you eat things, you swallow it. That's it. I was talking about worm eggs. I know it's kind of like stupid. But this is like what happens in our world, right? Some, some Somebody picks up some kind of parasite, intestinal parasite, and he goes to the bathroom. He's like, doesn't wash his hands, so he's like wiped himself and stuff. Guys, more don't wash their hands than do wash their hands. Um, that was actually a campaign we had at, uh, at Nunez one time. Not because we had like a problem with it, it was just like, the vice chancellor, that was like a thing. Like, wash your hands in the bathroom. It like, it, it, it made him uncomfortable that people weren't doing that. Um, rightfully so. Anyway, so that guy that works in that restaurant, you'd be surprised how many of them don't wash their hands. Um, he just walks out of the bathroom, goes back to making whatever, burritos, right, and uh, that's it. Then you eat it. Now stuff that was like in that dude's rectum is now in your stomach, right? But and that type of stuff, that's like an everyday type of occurrence, right? Or you just grab the doorknob to open the door, and in your other hand, you've got like a bag of Doritos. You've got like the, the hot and spicy Doritos, which are like really good, and you're like, mm -hmm, like that. And that's it. You've got stuff in your body, but it gets down to the stomach acid, deactivates it. So you're good. Right? Most of the time, you don't get sick from the stuff that you should get sick from because of your first line of defense. Gastric juice is a great example. You've never had intestinal parasites in you, as far as you know. That's why those eggs drop into that acid Done. It's finished. So that's all first line of defense. Or examples of first line of defense. All right, we need to get past the epithelial tissue. Now I'd like to talk about second line of defense. What happens when a pathogen does get into your interstitial, interstitial fluid or blood or wherever once it gets like in you, in you. Questions? I really hope that this is recording the whiteboard and not the. I'm going to pin it anyway, and not all of you guys. Coffee's at its maximum peak temperature. Second line of defense. 
Now you have to step it up a little bit because this, these pathogens got inside your body. So there are different types of second line of defense. One are, we have certain types of cells. <clears throat> Two main types of cells. One is a phagocyte or a macrophage. I'm just gonna write phagocytes. There are subtle differences between phagocytes and macrophages. I clump them all together. They are cells that eat other things, right? It's just, you know, there's a cell that access the pathogen. Here's like the next thing, kind of see where I'm going with this. Right, until finally it's just completely, it's just completely inside. It's in some kind of vacuum, right? So, you know, that's, that's what a macrophage does. It just engulfs it, it just takes it in and eats it. Um, sometimes they're, re they're referred to as just phagocytes. Sometimes they're macrophages. Um, same thing, right? Pretty much. So we have phagocytes that eat things. Some of them are, are, are wandering around your body. They're like patrolling. Some of them are fixed in certain spots. <clears throat> so you have some of them just hanging out under the epithelial tissue in your esophagus, for example, right? And if something gets through it, the phagocyte's waiting there. We even use this as a verb to phagocytize something. Oh, you've seen it. You've seen that word already. Another type of cell is a natural killer cell. So I'm just writing NK for natural killer. Natural killer cells do not eat pathogens. They attack them. They go after them. So natural killer cells have, they've got two weapons in their arsenal. All right, so these, uh, these weapons are also gonna be used by other cells that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. So natural killer cells attack cells, they've got two weapons, one, They've got a protein called perforin. Perforin, like perforate, by like, like making a hole, right? So perforin punches holes in um, other pathogens, in other cells. So it causes uh, cytolysis, right? It breaks the cell open. So that's one of its uh, weapons. And then the other thing that it has is another protein called uh, granzymes. Granzymes, so the thought right now is that, that our cells have like a pre-programmed idea of when they should die. And then ultimately this is going to be uh, why we die. I mean, who knows exactly, but um, ultimately, we die from, let's say, <clears throat> renal failure. I mean, if we don't get like a heart attack or something, we die from renal failure or whatever it is. Essentially, why? Because our cells, they aren't working like they should, right? Um, they don't work as well. That's why my skin's getting all wrinkly, because it doesn't work. They don't work like they used to. Why don't they work like they used to? Because they've got it built into them. They're gonna survive for a certain amount of time and then they start killing themselves off. They start committing suicide. That's the idea at least. And we call that we call that apoptosis. And so it's thought that granzymes induce this apoptosis. You know, it tells these pathogens, hey pathogen, you know how you're supposed to die at a certain period? That time is like right now. So, so that's what they do. So either they punch holes in them, cause everything to leak out, or they tell the cell or the pathogen, whatever, to kill itself. 
And so those are cells, those are, and again, we're talking about general immunity. This is what happens when a small number of some kind of pathogen just gets in our body and it's not going to be like a huge threat. We get some fungal spores, we breathe in fungal spores, right? And somehow those canidia, the, the, the spore, they, they get through, they bust through some epithelial tissue in our body. This is a, the phagocyte is gonna come over to it and, and take it out, right? So we have cells. There's four different things that we have as far as like the second line of defense, right? So the first thing, cells, different cells. The second thing are antimicrobial proteins. So antimicrobial proteins, there's different kinds. Actually, the first one we've heard of before. Hopefully you remember that word, transparent. Now you're thinking back to like the red blood cells, when they die and they get eaten up, phagocytized. Oh, I got to erase this word. When they get phagocytized, what happens to the iron, right? The iron gets picked up and it's transported by transparent, because the F-E-R-R -R means iron. All right, so what, why would this help our immune system? Because there's a lot of pathogenic bacteria that use iron to replicate. So if you could take away the iron from them, then, um, that's it, they can't replicate, right? The good bacteria that are in us, they don't necessarily use iron, but like pathogenic bacteria that can get into us, they, they, a lot of them like to use iron. And so if we could just, transparent will come in, take that iron and keep it from them. It's the same idea, that's one of the things that are in, um, that are in breast milk, right? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of helpful things in, um, like lactoherin and um, lactoferrin, which is the same idea, right? You just you take this bad bacteria away from pathogenic. I'm sorry, take this uh, iron away from like pathogenic bacteria. So we have that like naturally in our body. We can use transferrin for that. We can also use something called interferon. You might see interferon in a hospital setting because they use it for other things. Like, um, it's, it's supposed to be for viruses. Interferon's for viruses, but they use it for, um, I don't know, whatever. Like uh, pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary sclerosis, something like, they use it for autoimmune diseases. They don't know why it works, but it just works. So, viruses, we talked about those last class. Viruses, their deal is they, um, they're endogenous, meaning that they go into the cell, they go into the cell, then they, um, then they start doing the damage, right? They go into the cell and then they get our cells DNA to make more of these viruses. And so we don't know that we're infected often until it's too late. We don't know when we're infected until it gets into our cell. So, um, and, and a lot of viruses are really tricky. On their way out of our cell, like they're leaving our cell, they cover themselves with our cell wall. On their way out, they're like, yes, and like, that's it, now they look like us. Right, so we can't recognize them. Um, 
But some cells, certain types of cells, will, will release this chemical called interferon, and it lets other cells nearby know, okay, it's too late for me, but just to let you know, there's viruses around and start making your defenses, right? Our cells can, can produce antiviral proteins. Like we could, to some extent, we could fight viruses. We have tools, just that we don't know that we're infected. That's part of the danger with viruses. But if you can prepare your cells, then yeah, you can do something about it. So that's one tool. You'll see it, they use, they use it for autoimmune diseases. They use uh, interferon gamma a lot. Um, but anyway, and then um, there's another one I put, um, it's not like a really, it's, it's a little more complex. I, in the other video I talk about complement. Um, you can read about it in that. So we have antimicrobial proteins, right? Here's, here's an example of, of two of them. So we have two types of cells, two types of antimicrobial proteins. And then third, we're gonna have inflammation. So the first thing we're going to have with inflammation is increased permeability. And increased um, blood flow, I guess I could say. Vasodilation. So, um, you know, we talked about it with shock. Like I say, oh, when you get shocked by I mean, when you get stung by a bee in your hand, and you want to get all of these like antitoxins and stuff to your hand, well, your hand would get would get inflamed, right? It will swell up because you want to. You want to swell. You want to. So you want to get like increased fluid to the area, right? So you're going to vasodilate these blood vessels like close to the area, and um, the increased fluid hopefully locks that toxin and kind of keeps it down in your hand and, and, and helps to prevent it from spreading other places in your body. So increased permeability means you allow more fluid out of the capillaries because we're trying to get white blood cells to it. We're trying to get eosinophils to it, for example. <clears throat> so we want, we want the fluid to get out of your blood vessels faster. We also want to get blood to that area faster, so we're going to um, have vasodilation. So that's inflammation. We try to treat inflammation, which yes, of course, we should try to treat it, but I mean, we should think twice about it because maybe, for the example of getting stung, maybe we should just like chill out for a few minutes and let our body deal with it, right? The, the thing that sucked that happened is that you got stung, all right? So that's that's already happened. So it's not it's not going to get worse than that, right? So your hand's going to inflame, and I mean, unless you're allergic, but I mean, your hand's going to get inflamed and just let it hot. It's going to get hot because it's got increased blood flow, and yeah, you want it to be hot. So just sometimes we got to like let it just be what it is. Oh, did you guys get the pun? Um, all right, inflammation, last one, fever. No one's watching you, you can laugh. If I say let it be what it is, no one, except for maybe Bridget, I think she's at work. No one's gonna know you laughed at something stupid. Fever. This is, this is another thing that we, we tend to, to treat. We, we get a fever of 100 degrees, and 
we start freaking out and we want to try to like Tylenol our way out of it. Why? I mean, think about what's happening with your body. It's getting hot. That's good. So the heat is, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not like a good environment. I guess I could write that. Inhospitable. Again, what, what temperature do pathogens that infect us, what temperature do they like? Well, that's very easy. They like 98, 99. They work really well at 99. They don't work so well at 100, 100.5. They don't work at 100.5. Like, like it's harder for them, right? And why are you having a fever? Because your body is ramping up its uh, metabolism. You're trying to fight an infection. So I'm not saying that 104 fever should be left by itself. Absolutely not. But a low-grade fever, I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, but that's what we do. Even our kids, especially with our kids, like we treat, you know, 99. Little kids have 99. That's a normal temperature. Think about what temperature, like, why did we come up with this number of 98.6? It's just an average. It's an average that like some dude took the temperature of thousands of people and then he just averaged that number and he got 98.6. In fact, um, they think that, that maybe that number was a little bit higher than it, than it should, I don't know, whatever. So anyway, the point is, you know, 99, 99 and a half. If your kid's running 99 and a half, don't give them Tylenol or anything. Just leave them alone. Easier said than done, I know. But I'll tell you this, for those of you with young kids, that type of attitude that you gotta take away all their problems and stuff, that's gonna come back and bite you in the ass when they're teenagers because they're not going to be able to like handle their business. They're going to like look to you for everything. They're not going to know how to like run a dishwasher. Oh, I don't know. There's lots of like buttons and sliding shit, and I don't know how to deal with this, Dad. So let them just let them figure stuff out, like a low grade fever. All right, so fever. That's the fourth thing. Which it's, it's like, what did I put for? Nothing really. You just want to make things, you want to let things be a little bit hot. That's a natural response. You want to make, you want to make it uncomfortable for those, for that bacteria or those viruses. So. <clears throat> any, that's, any question on, any questions on general immunity? First line or second line? I want you to know these, not just cells, you can't just write this like I did. That is not gonna count. I wanna know what, what for cell? And don't just put phagocytes, what are phagocytes? Like, you know, there's cells that eat things. And you think, well, that's stupid. Why should I write there's cells that eat things? Like, that's, that's a stupid thing to put. I know, but, a lot of you guys don't actually know that. You memorize the word phagocyte until exam three is over, and then you're going to forget the word phagocyte. It's just a word. It's just symbols. It's like that card game. You flip this card over. Oh, I remember where that card is, and you flip the other card over. I don't want it to be like that game. Right? So I, you should know phagocytes, and you should know what natural killer cells are. I mean, you should know about these antimicrobial proteins and all this stuff. I mean, there's not too much to put for fever. And inflammation, um, oh, I forgot to tell you something with inflammation. Uh, I'll let you look it up. Anyway, there's some chemicals that help with the increased permeability and um, the vasodilation. 
There are histamines, for example. So in the inflammation response, histamines, there's uh, kinins. They help to, um, they help amplify the effects of, of histamines. There's uh, prostaglandins. And there's lastly, gluco, glucotriones, I'm just telling you, I'm working on it. So we've got like these different chemicals that are involved in this reaction. Uh, when we have like allergies, this is what, you know, we take an antihistamine, but really we're kind of going after these chemicals. We're also going after prostaglandins and glucotriones because they, they're, they're all helping with this inflammation response. So anyway, just, you can look it up on the other video. So when I'm talking about specific immunity. So no questions, right? <clears throat> hey, if you guys are doing that, whatever thing that I gave you, Conyer or something, this might be your last test on Monday. Might, for some of you. All right, specific immunity. We've got, uh, there's two types, right? There's, uh, there's cell mediated and then there's antibody mediated. Because they're different things. They're two different ways to, um, two, for two different ways to approach the battle, right? So I always envision this as being like a battle, right? And when you fight a battle, you have, um, you've got like three parts, right? First, you've got like the the Marines, but whoever has the gun and is or, or the weapons and is doing like the actual fighting, right? So you've got them, right? So in, in this uh, analogy, we're gonna call these T8 cells. So they're T cells, but they've got like this protein protein on them called CD8, so we call them T8 cells. Um, so you have the, the, the killers, right? The ones that are doing the actual fighting. They're kind of like natural killer cells. They use the same weapons. The difference is they're going after only one thing and they're really good at it. All right, and then on the other side, we have antibodies, which um, antibodies are, they don't kill anything. They they do some other they do some other things. Well, let's talk about what they do. Antibodies um, cluster pathogens. They call this agglutination. So they cluster them, they, they gather them together. Much easier to kill pathogens when they're all grouped together. They block bacterial toxins. And they prevent viral attachment. <clears throat> it's the toxin that gets you sick from a bacteria. It's not the bacteria itself. It's just the bacteria eat things 
and they excrete things just like we do. We eat and we poop. So do bacteria. So that's their toxins. That's what makes us sick. And then prevent viral attachment. If you can prevent the virus from attaching to your cell, they're finished. You won, right? Because that's how they do their damage once they get in your cell, not from outside the cell. They're endogenous. But that's not, you know, these things aren't killing the pathogens. Um, they, they enhance phagocytosis. Like the, the, the antibody, they've got like this stem region, like the, the, the part of the shape of them is like a flag, right? So when they attached to something, you can easily see them. They're like glowing, or they're not glowing, but you know what I'm saying, like they're, they're really easy to see, right? So they're really easy for phagocytes to get to, or T cells or whatever. They're, it's easy for, for TA cells to get to, right? So they cluster pathogens, they block toxins, prevent viral attachment, enhance phagocytosis, they immobilize bacteria. Meaning, you know, bacteria, um, they're really good at moving around your body because they use cilia. Um, so if you could knock the cilia off their, their, or if you could stop their cilia, you could prevent them from moving around. Now it's a lot easier to, to get them. <clears throat> I might be missing something. I feel like I am, but um, I don't know. If anyone thinks of it, you can just chime in. Otherwise, um, your book or the other video has everything. I just can't remember if I'm missing anything. Um, I always think of this like at a kid's party when it's like little kids when it's time to go and you're trying to like get the kids together. It's impossible, right? You grab one, and that kid's like squirming, right? And you go to try to get another one, and you grab that one, and that first kid runs away, and now you gotta go run after that kid. Hey, Harrison, come on, buddy. Come on, little Clinton, we don't want to time out. None of my kids are named this, by the way. I'm just, that's what I imagine their names are. Come on, Jackson. Put those peanuts down. Let's go, buddy. And, the, and they always call him buddy. Come on, buddy. And there, it's like a pain in the ass to get them. Right? What if we could just chop their legs off? And somebody, like, chops their legs off and then just grabs them all and just puts them right here. Dad, right here. You can grab them. Go throw them in the car. I already did all the work for you. That's like what antibodies do. So it's a lot easier for the T8 cells to come in and massacre all of them. The cells, I mean, not the kids. So that's what antibodies do. They don't kill, but the T8 cells cannot do their job without the antibodies. The antibodies would be useless without the T8 cells. You can't just send antibodies by themselves and, and fight the fight. So antibody cells, I'm going to erase this now. So antibodies, well, I'll leave this. They're ultimately made by these cells called B cells. So we have T cells and we have B cells. T8 cells and then B cells. So B cells are eventually going to become these other types of cells called plasma cells. And plasma cells are going to secrete 
millions of antibodies. So the B cells are going to be the ones that are going to ultimately make the antibodies. B cells become or like clone into plasma cells. Plasma cells are going to, um, each one of them makes thousands of antibodies. The antibodies are just proteins. That's all they are. They're not like cells. The antibodies are just proteins. Now, you have TA cells, you have B cells. There's another type of cell that's like in the middle, kind of helping both sides, and they're called T4 cells. Sometimes they call them helper, helper T cells. So there's like killer T cells, or sometimes they're called cytotoxic T cells. There's helper T cells, so there's two types of T cells, T4 and T8, and then we have B cells. Helper T cells, they're, they're kind of like the command and control center. They're going to be, they're going to be directing the battle. Okay, T8 cells, go, go in. Okay, B cells, go. All right, because the T8 and the B cells will not go unless the T4 cells have told them to. This one makes HIV so, uh, well, used to make it deadly, is that it, uh, it, it attacked the T4 cells. There's a virus that's specialized in infecting T4 cells. If you take out the T4 cells, you can take out, you can take out the whole immune system. Viruses are... Viruses are smart, messed up. Well, I don't have to tell you guys. You're all at home. I don't know why I'm here by myself. Um, yeah, but look what it did. They're so simple. Um, Okay, what now? So, the T8 cells and the B cell. Well, let's talk about the T8 cells. The T8 cells are going to become cytotoxic T cells. They're going to clone. Not all the T cells, but some T cells are going to clone, and they're, they're going to make millions of copies of themselves. And they're going to become these, you know, uh, killer T cells, or I'll call them cytotoxic T cells. And cytotoxic T cells have the same exact weapons. They use perforin and granzymes. Same thing as the natural killer cells, except that these are specific immunity, and there's millions and millions and millions of these. Right? There's a whole army of these cytotoxic T cells which are only able to go after one particular strain. So what gets these T8 cells going? How do we get from here to here? Well, we have to, we have to do a couple things. One, we have to show T8 cells exactly what they need to kill. So they're good at killing, they're just not good at knowing what to kill. And you have to take the thing that you're gonna that you're gonna want them to kill and you have to like put it right in front of them. Like see this? Go kill the thing that looks like this. So there's a special cell that shows the T8 cells. Right? So when you get infected with something and let's say you trip out your, you trip your immune system through like lymph nodes or whatever it is, then there's certain cells hanging around, and what those these cells are called antigen presenting cells. So let me erase this side for a second.
and the name tells you exactly what they do. These are cells that present the antigen to the T8 cell. Remember, the antigen is just the protein pieces on the wall of the bacteria or the virus or whatever it is. Right? It's not, you don't have to take the whole virus. You can just take a piece of it, a piece of its clothing, and take that off and um, show it to the T8 cell. It's like taking the flag off the uniform and then say, see, look at this flag. I tore this off the shoulder. Everything with this flag, you go kill it. That's kind of what it's like. So antigen presenting cells are going to phagocytize the, the, um, the pathogen. Let's say it's a bacteria that infected you, right? They're going to eat the bacteria. They're going to take the antigen off of it. And they're going to use it on their, which I forgot to tell you about, on, on their MHC molecule. So, I was telling you guys last time that our, our blood cells have like type A, type B, and type O. <clears throat> the rest of our cells have these, these uh, receptors, like these, these protein markers on our cells that identify them as being just belonging to us. Right? So your cells have a different MHC than my cells, and bacteria have a different MHC than both of us. So that's just the protein that's on the uh, membrane. And that identifies you. So what happens is that um, when the antigen presenting cell, it, it eats the pathogen, it eats the bacteria, it takes it takes, um, it takes parts of the bacteria, like it takes like parts of its MHC of the bacteria, and it makes its own MHC. So your you have your antigen presenting cells are making the marker with pieces of the antigen presenting cell. So something doesn't quite look right with these antigen presenting cells. They're made with like proteins that belong on this bacteria. They're made with like foreign proteins. So when the T8 cells see these antigen presenting cells, they can tell that, okay, those are cells that belong to my body, but something weird about them, that doesn't, they don't belong. And that's how we know what to go uh, attack. We're gonna attack anything with that antigen because the antigen presenting cell, it ate the bacteria and it took the pieces off of it and it made its own MHC molecule with it. And then it shows up to the area where all the T cells hang out and it's like, hey, look at me. You recognize anything about me that looks weird? And it's got like a different flag right here. And then some of the T cells will be like, hey, what's up with that flag? That's not our flag, that's someone else's flag. And the antigen presenting cells like, that's right. I fucked this pathogen up. Go take out everything with this flag on. And now the T8 cell, those few T8 cells, because not all of them are going to ask, but the few T8 cells that do, they start getting all amped up. They're like excited now. Yeah, let's go. <clears throat> so they're stimulated now. Now they're ready to go, but that's not enough. Now they call the command and control center. They're like, hey, T4. This antigen presenting cell just showed us like somebody that's that's invaded us. Can we go kill them? And the T4 cell has to come back and say, yeah, go ahead. Like, yeah, we've confirmed also that these are there. Like, we know that bacteria is there. Go ahead and take them out. So you need two stimulations. You need one from the antigen presenting cell. They have to look at this MHC complex. Two, they need to get this signal from the T4 cell. We call this signal a chemical 
interleukin interleukin two. We can just put IL two. That's the name of the chemical, right? So they're looking for two things. They're looking for the, the MHC on the antigen presenting cell that gets them all stimulated. And then they're looking for confirmation. They're looking for interleukin-2 from the T4 cell. That's like a confirmation. When they get both of those stimuli, then they're going to start cloning. Those few T8 cells that recognized there was a problem and they got permission to start doing something about it, they're starting to clone now. They're making clones of themselves. And that's what the cytotoxic cells are. They're clones that are specialized in killing that particular bacteria or whatever it is. If it was a virus, the antigen presenting cell doesn't need to eat it, does it? You don't have to eat the virus because the virus is going to come into you. So the virus will go into the antigen presenting cell, but then it does the same thing. It rips the virus apart and it uses some of the pieces of the virus in its MHC molecule. Does anybody have questions on this? Because I kind of made it confusing, I think, at parts. So two stimuli. There's two things that get this T8 cell going. That's your immune system, right? That's why you feel sick, like achy joints and all that. That's your immune system ramping up. That's not the pathogen making you sick. That's the immune system going. Because now it's a, it's, a, it's a battle. You know, the virus has already made 5 million other viruses, and each one of those are set to make a bunch themselves. Right, so they already got a head start. So you have to make your army to go fight their army. Otherwise, you know, you're finished, right? Their army is gonna become too powerful. Right? So but the thing is your army's only good at fighting that one army. It's very well specific, very tailored. To that one thing. And sometimes these uh, sometimes these viruses are, are like tricky. They'll they'll change they'll change the antigens. So your body goes and like makes a whole army, goes through this whole process, and you make this army, and all the cytotoxic T cells they get to the battlefield, they're like, yeah. And then the virus is like, who are you here for? Like, who? i never seen them, because they change what they look like. They change their proteins. Like, we don't know who that is, and then they all got to go back to the beginning again. Oh, man, let's go back to base. And they got to start over again. Make another, they make another army, a whole different army. They get out there, and bacteria's like, no, man, those dudes left. That was yesterday. They're gone now. Like sometimes viruses can be like super difficult. Um, herpes virus, like chickenpox. Um, I got chickenpox a few years ago. That's like one of the herpes. There's like eight different types of herpes, or ten, right? About eighty percent of us have had some kind of herpes infection. Oh, you all nasty with your herpes. Um, but there's like lots of different types, right? They use our nervous system. They're like brilliant. Like nobody goes and looks for them in our neurons. They're using our neurons to travel around our body. That's why they like they pop up in the same places because um, they're using they're using our nervous system. Viruses are brilliant for being so simple. All right, sorry, I'm getting off topic. Um, let me erase this side. Well, let me erase this here. Let me go back to the um, antibodies. It's the same story with the B cells, right? 
B cells are sitting around. I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, but I mean, I'd rather you understand the basic idea behind it. B cells are sitting around. Antigen presenting cells walk up to them and say, hey, look what's infected us. B cells start getting all worked up by it. And the B cells are going to look to the T4 cells. And they're going to say, hey, antigen presenting cells just told us something's up. Can we, can we do something about it? Then the T4 is going to, same chemical, interleukin-2. Then the B cells will start cloning. And they're going to start making, you know, just like we were before, they start becoming plasma cells. And those plasma cells, as you already know, they're going to secrete uh, antibodies. So both sides. That's kind of a crash course for, it is a crash course, but it's like way, you know, there's like more stuff. But this is the idea behind your immune system. After the battle is finished, after the battle is over, <clears throat> some of these B cells are gonna stay around, like the old veterans. Some of the T cells are gonna stay around, the veterans. If the Nazis ever try to invade us again, they remember what those Nazis look like. And so they're not even gonna have a chance. Nazis get off the plane over at JFK and we're gonna kill them right there. They're not gonna make it out of the airport. It's not gonna be a battle. So people say, oh, you can't get sick twice. Well, I mean, you can get reinfected twice. And maybe you'll get sick again. Depends on the veterans, right? I mean, once those veterans die off, we might forget what Nazis look like. They're gonna, I know it won't, but I like the story so far. Then the Nazis might come back one day, right? That's what happens with immunity. Sometimes it doesn't stay around a long time, right? We don't know about the coronavirus thing, right? Maybe they can remember a long time. Maybe some of these T cells and B cells call them memory T cells or memory B cells, maybe they're not so good at remembering. So we might be able to get infected again. But most diseases, the memory cells remember. We, we have a catalog of it. And so you have a flu and you give the flu to your mother. Your mother's going to give it back to you, but it's not going to even have a chance because we're already ready. Like, we already went through that battle before. We're not going to wait until you have one million viruses. We're just going to take you out right away. So we don't get sick. <clears throat> um, yeah, the vaccines are what? They're just antigens. Same thing. You don't have to take the whole virus. What if we just took pieces of the virus on the outside, like the proteins? and we just injected the proteins into you, we're going to get this whole thing going. We get this whole process going. It's not going to be severe because it's not like, you know, it's not like there's a million viruses. It's just an injection. It's just some viruses. It's just like enough, not viruses, but the pieces of the virus, the antigens. Right? It's enough that it just gets us, um, it triggers our immune system. And then we have the memory T cells and the memory B cells. So if we do get infected, it's not going to have a chance to get to us. Because remember, we can do something about viruses if we know what the problem is. Like our body does have defenses. It's just that we never know until it's too late. Questions? You probably have a question. What type of test question am I going to ask? That's a good question. Um, I don't know how I'm going to ask this. Maybe I'll want you to just write it out. Give me a paragraph on specific or, or cell-mediated immunity or specific immunity. Write me a paragraph on specific immunity. So you should be able to explain and I got all the arrows and stuff. You should be able to explain this to somebody in a way that doesn't involve arrows. 
right? Because this doesn't explain anything to people. This is me being lazy. I didn't want to write it all out. But you should be able to understand this and explain what's going on. So think about like the, you know, first of all, think about who the actors are. There's three actors, T8 cells, T4 cells, and B cells. T8 cells and B cells get two stimulations. One from the antigen presenting cells. They present the antigen. The second stimulation is interleukin-2. What's the result of that? Well, on one side, on the cell-mediated side, you get cytotoxic T cells. On the antibody-mediated side, you're ultimately going to get antibodies. Um, that would be like one question. I might ask you a second question. What do antibodies do? What are the functions of antibodies? So you should have an idea of what they do. Question three, discuss the, um, discuss the second line of defense. So that's kind of a long question in itself because you have, you have to discuss the cells, the two types of cells and the two types of, um, at least the two we talked about, the two types of antimicrobial proteins. Then third, you have to discuss the inflammation. And what are the two things that happen with inflammation? Um, be nice if you made a discussion of like prostaglandins and histamines, but um, I might leave that up to you. For um, fever, don't just write fever. Like, don't just write cells, don't just write fever. What is it about fever? Like, what? Okay, fever, what? What is fever? I know the answer is simple you get hot. Pathogens don't like an elevated body temperature. They don't work well with that. I know the answer is simple, but I just want to make sure you know, again, I don't want you playing that card flipping game. I want you to know actually what fever is, instead of just memorizing F-E-V-E-R. That's just five letters, and you just memorize it, and I'll spit it back out on the test, because I know, I'm positive that a few of you are doing it. You're memorizing it just to spit it out. And I get it. At the end of the day, you got to do whatever you have to do to pass the class, right? You just need to get through this to go to the next thing. I get it, but it's a lot better for you if you like have an idea. All right. Um, first line of defense. That'd be like question four. Question four. First line of defense. Um, list most of them. A lot of them, I don't know how many I'll ask, but you should know the first line of defense, have some idea about it. Um, and then I might ask some question like, how are natural killer cells the same as cytotoxic T cells? How are they similar? How are they different? Even now you should be able to answer that. How are these like, because I already have the answer written here, how are these like natural killer cells? The weapons, they, do, they kill the same way. How are they different? This is specific immunity. These only know how to kill one thing. Natural killer cells know how to kill many things, as long as there's only a small number of those things. If there's too many of them, natural killer cells don't work. Cytotoxic T cells, they work for many things, like many, a large number of, of one type of pathogen. That's how they're different. That's how they're similar. Then, um, so anyway, that's four, possibly five questions there. And then um, I'd like you to know what the lymphatic system does, the functions of the lymphatic system. I wrote down three things. That's from the last lecture. Functions of lymphatic system, that's like six, question six. Uh, seven, um, now I'm kind of stretching to find a seventh one. Primary and secondary organs, that's kind of a stretch. But what are the primary organs? 
what are the secondary organs? Primary organs for, I think I just put two, or three maybe. I put um, bone marrow, that's where the B comes from, bone marrow. I put thymus, that's where the T comes from. And then secondary, I think I put spleen. Lymph nodes, I mean, they're in the nodes. So this test is not until Monday. We're off for Thanksgiving. So no class Wednesday, no class the rest of the week. I can't, I'm not gonna give you an exam just on this only. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna go into a respiratory system, and um, if that's as far as I get, then then that's fine. But I'm gonna start. So I've got a, a got a video that I already made on the respiratory system um, using PowerPoints. It's one of those. So I'm going to post that, and I'll probably get my last three or four questions from the respiratory system. So we're looking at the lymphatic system in its entirety. That was, yet, that was last lecture and today, and then respiratory. That's what's gonna go on exam three. For some of you, that's it. For some of you, that might not be it. And remember that, that extra, that, that extra credit thing or that Thing, that side thing that I was asking you got, that I was giving you guys the option to do, you can replace any test grade with it. So if you got a 20 on some exam, then you could just replace that grade with it and take your final still. All right, you can put it anywhere you want. You can put that grade anywhere you want, including the final exam. So that's about it for today. Questions? I'm gonna stop recording. You guys feel free to stay Would on. You and ask any question? Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you mind repeating the question again?